know if you can hear me, see me. I'm just checking to see if I'm here. We are doing a quiz today. and on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturdays, we do grade 11 portions. Um, today is a Monday and we're kick-starting the week with a quiz. So it's just going to be a really quick revision of two lessons in MCQ format. This is the quiz code for today. It's 78408561 and I'm going to put it down in the chat box. You can kind of just copy-paste it. So one thing you should know is that if you've not done a Menti quiz before, you basically go to menti.com and you type in this particular code and um, then we can get started on the quiz. So let me know if you are joining the quiz, if you're having any trouble joining the quiz, if um, all is well on your end. Do I call you that? 
there's something called an academy plus as i was saying um and it has a lot of features that you can access um a lot more courses than are available on youtube a lot more study material a lot more practice tests so that's something that you're interested in especially because they have like weekly mock tests which means that you get practice regularly every week um then these are the prices for an academy plus as you can see you can get like anything from a 3 month subscription to a 24 month subscription um the longer you get it for the more cost effective it is simply because um the prices are very very different um per month costs um based on how long you take it for um there's also something called an academy iconic and i know you all probably know about it by now but i'm going to tell you while you all join our quiz hopefully and the quiz code is in the chat it's at the very top of the chat you can just type that into menti.com and you can get started with the quiz as soon as i'm done talking to you about this let me know if you're having any trouble joining the quiz but yeah there is also something called an academy iconic on which you get personal tutoring um so it's like you work one on one with educators to kind of study and figure out what your weak spots are and figure out what your strong spots are what you need to work on more things like that so if you're looking for more personal support and personal help then you should go for an academy iconic instead and these are the prices for an academy iconic again you can see that the per month costs are very different based on how long you take a subscription for and again um prices are a lot less if you the per month cost is a lot less if you take the subscription for a longer duration of time that's something that i wanted to note to you and yeah my referral code holds for this as well and my referral code is dhpr01 um all of that said i think we should go ahead and start this quiz um is a bit of a mixed up quiz in the sense that some questions are very easy some are very difficult and should we go ahead and start that is a really cute emoji I love, I love it. <laughs> okay. I think that is a positive. So we will go ahead and start then. Okay. So for the very first set of questions, um we have an extract and then we have a bunch of questions based on the extract. And this is the extract. I have nothing else to do. He mutters, looking away. go to school i say glibly realizing immediately how hollow the advice must sound there is no school in my neighborhood when they build one i will go home. okay i hope you had a chance to look at the extract and we're going to go ahead and we're going to answer a couple of questions based on the extract now There is a really cute mouse. Um, I think there is just one person here today. There are two people here today. There is a frog and a mouse. That is an interesting combination. Um, so the frog and the mouse will go ahead and answer our first question, which is identify I in that passage. Hello, Manoj. We're doing quiz today. If you want to join us, so Mendy quiz and the code is at the top of the chat box. Seven eight four zero eight five six one. You can also just stay and listen to us. Okay. Uh, both the frog and the mouse got this one wrong. Um, I in this paragraph is the narrator. and the narrator in this case is the author of the piece so it's anise jung who is speaking to us as i um 
that said, it should make this question easier. Okay, so identify he now. Sorry about option 4, I just didn't fill that in, I think. I meant to remove it. <laughs> Okay, um, again, like you picked two different things, but he in this case is Sahib. Um, the author is speaking to Sahib in this particular paragraph at the very beginning of the lesson, Lost Spring. And when she is speaking to Sahib, um, she is the I, and so Anis Jung is the I throughout this piece. Um, she is the author, she is the narrator, she is the person from whose point of view we are getting the lesson. Um, and the he at the very beginning is Sahib. Later on, she also talks to Mukesh. So there are two main characters in the story other than Anis Jam. One of them is Sahib, one of them is Mukesh. And the one we just encountered in that particular paragraph is Sahib. Glibly means thoughtlessly. Generally, the word can also mean hollow or funny, but in this particular context, because of the nature of the things that Anise is saying, um, the word comes to mean thoughtlessly. And maybe we can talk about why after you all are done with this particular question. Um, good answer from both of you. Um, it does tell us that occasionally Anise just speaks without thinking and she is very careless with some of the things that she says. But um, one other thing that we also know from this particular thing, this particular extract, is that Anise is also very unaware, right, of the state of the rag picker's life. Which is to say that she just doesn't know that in fact Sahib can't go to school and the fact that somebody is offering him the possibility of them building a school for him is something that will mean a lot to him. So she's not speaking without thinking in the sense that she is trying to be cruel. She just, she just doesn't have enough information about these people's lives in order to be careful with them and their feelings either. Right? So two things. Yeah, multiple correct, correct answers in this particular case. Um, sorry about the background noise. I live somewhere that's really, really hot, so I need to have the fan on. But um, what to do? Makes a lot of noise. Okay, we have another extract question. This is the extract. Far, far from gusty waves, these children's faces, like rootless weeds, the hair torn around their pallor. And now we'll have a couple of questions based on this extract again. Stephen Spender is the poet in this case and the poem is of course an elementary school classroom in a slum
we're on question number six and this is also linked hi Kagendra yes I can wait um, this question has started already but you can join us for the next one the code is 7840856 so name the poetic devices in these lines okay um, someone's picked metaphor, someone's picked simile. Simile is the wrong answer. We'll talk about why in a minute when you answer the very next question. Um, I am going to just go ahead and drink some water and, And start this question because I don't think Khagendra can join us for this particular question because it's based on the extract. But that is okay. Yeah, which of these is the metaphor? And after you pick the metaphor, and you know, there's another question about what does the metaphor mean? And after that, let's talk about why it is this that is the metaphor and what makes it a metaphor. Okay, um, you've picked a lot of things. Um, all right, let's talk about this in a bit. Gusty waves is the right answer, that is the metaphor. Um, also, whoever said simile, you also would have been right in that question. I don't think I clicked correct answer for that, but yeah. What is Gusty Waves a metaphor for? Yeah, it's a metaphor for those people who are full of energy in life, right? And let's talk about this for a moment. Um, there were two poetic devices in that line. One is a metaphor, which is gusty waves. Another is a simile, which is um, like rootless waves. And we know that that's a simile because it has the word like. Um, like or as, when either of these words are used and there's a comparison that's being made, we know that there is a simile at play. But when there's a comparison being made without any kind of like or as or any other kind of connecting word, it just seems as though there is just a random set of words that we know doesn't actually mean what it says, but refers to something else, like gusty waves, for example. Here we know that gusty waves doesn't refer to like strong winds, but it refers to people who are full of energy and life, right? So these set of words don't actually mean what they seem to mean, and they seem to mean something completely different. And so there's a comparison being made here without any sort of explicit connection that's being created between gusty waves and people who are full of energy in life. We're supposed to make that connection ourselves, right? And you did that here, and you did it really well too, because you picked the right answer. Um, but in a case like that, it's a metaphor, and so that is the metaphor in this case. Whereas simile, as I said already, uses like or as. Um, yeah, we will show the scoreboard at the very end column. Hello, Hansraj. Are you going to join our quiz? Yeah, so now, what is this simile, this comparison with ruthless waves? Tell us about these children. It's a really good simile, like it has a lot of content in it. Okay, um, whoever picked like the answers that you picked, 
all of you are correct. Um, there are two things that are going on with the rootless weeds comparison. What are weeds? They're the plants that aren't wanted in any garden, right? Um, they're considered the kind of useless plants. So what people do is they pluck the weeds out of their garden so that the nutrition and all of the resources in the garden can go towards the other plants in the garden, which are the plants that people actually want to grow. Rootless also tells us that these weeds are simply not connected to the soil at all, which means that they can't suck up any kind of food from the soil, which means that these children are underfed, they are undernourished, and we know that also because of the way that these children's bodies are described as weak, as fragile. Um, and we also know that they're treated as, as if they're unwanted because when it comes to the larger picture of society, um, nobody is paying them enough attention, right? Um, they're not unwanted. They're, they're human beings, and so they should be treated better, but nobody is treating them better. And so that means that they are being treated like they're unnecessary and they're unwanted. So that particular summary has a lot going on in it, yeah. Another extract question, but promises like mine abound in every corner of this bleak world. And our next question is connected to this extract, so I hope you all got a good look at it. Hi everyone, I see a couple more people here, so I just want to let you know we're doing a quiz. And if you're interested in joining us, um, the code for the quiz is at the top of my screen and I'm going to type it out in the chat again. Yeah, and you can join us. Okay, um, I can see why you'd get confused. Promises like mine in this particular case are thoughtless promises, um, simply because when we think about an Easter, right, we know that in that moment when she's making that promise, she's not saying, oh, I'm gonna do this for you, and lying about it she just doesn't think again she isn't like oh i'm being entirely sincere about this will i actually do this these aren't questions that she thinks about or considers before she makes the promise she just says it she just kind of carelessly offers that out there um so in her particular case it's a thoughtless promise though in the cases of other people who are making such promises, it is definitely a false promise because they know that what they're saying isn't something that they are going to execute, right? But as in the case of Anis, again, simply careless. And who are these other people who are making a lot of false promises in Sahib's bleak world? Those answers are right. Politicians are making such false promises and officials are making such false promises. So it's the government setup, it's the institutional setup of society. Politics is a... Votes depend on making promises to people. And you get votes very often by making false promises to people, right? It's a very convenient way for politicians to come to power. And of course there's corruption so officials but we're on to the next question which is what does sahib's name mean this is an easy one i think oh no <laughs> okay um sahib's name is sahib alam um and it means lord of the universe it um does not mean king of the universe or king or lord though if you're if you're chosen lord you'd be like part we're on question 13 of 31 and we still have 18 questions to go. What is the irony of the fact that Sahib is named Sahib Ayala? Okay, 
agree with you, right, in this case. Um, irony is a situation in which um, something about two things doesn't quite fit together, right? Um, it's a little funny how badly they don't fit together. Um, so, for instance, here, Sahib's name means Lord of the Universe, but he is definitely not the Lord of the Universe, right? Um, in fact, he is struggling to even get food or access to a school. And so, in this particular case, it's the fact that he is very far from being Lord of the Universe that is considered an irony. Hello to Himanshi and yes, Kagendra, I can wait a minute. What's what's up though? Are you having issues joining the Yeah, thank you, Guru. The leader goes at the end. Alright. Shall we go on to the next question? Um, this is from the poem, right? Um, and here, this is, I think it's the first verse around the third line or something like that. We're getting a breakdown of the pupils in the class. We're getting a breakdown of what each of those students is like. And then we reach the third student who is described to us. And it's a boy who is the stunted heir of his father's null disease. And the lesson that he is reciting, we are told, is his father's null disease um what does that mean i'm wondering if i have another question about this right after this so i'm just gonna check that um and if i don't i'll just tell you what it means yeah okay all right maybe after you answer this i will go ahead and I am from Tamil Nadu, Kala. Okay, this is an example of a metaphor. Um, reciting the word is a metaphor here, and I'll tell you why, but I'll also tell you what an anaphora is first. An anaphora is when a poem has the same starting words to like each line. Um, so if, for instance, there's a poem about September sunlight, then each line of the poem would start, September sunlight is warm. September sunlight, sunlight is humid. September sunlight is yellow. So a situation like that is an anaphora. But a metaphor, as we know, is a comparison that's being made without us being directly told that a comparison is being made, which is why sometimes it can be a little bit more difficult to catch on to what a metaphor is, right? And in this particular case, reciting is a metaphor because we're using the language of the classroom in which we recite lessons to explain the nature of disease and the nature of genetic disease where the boy kind of learns the disease from his father. Um, the blueprint of it is in his genes and he repeats the same steps that his father has repeated in his life in the sense that he too will have the same sorts of side effects, the same sorts of things will happen to him across the course of his life as his disease goes on and on and on. So in this case, the recitation is actually that kind of repetition of a genetic inherited disease and uh, the lesson is the disease which is you know if we took a guess as to what that particular disease is it would be rickets i think yes that is actually why i am only speaking english um i've lived in hindi speaking areas for a bit but while i can understand what you're saying um when you like speak in Hindi, I can't speak it 
my Hindi grammar is really bad. It's it's atrociously bad. Hello to somebody called Sunrise. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. I didn't pick a right answer in this, but the right answer is narrow streets. And all of you are absolutely right. What is not on the posters on the wall is narrow streets. Yes, Himanshi, I can understand Hindi, but I can't speak it. Whoever is Sunrise, what paper did you write? Oh, math. And it was easier than you thought? That's good. That's promising. Maybe you just studied really well, so it seems easy to you. Anyway, we're on to the next question in the quiz, which is, why do people say that staying barefoot is a tradition? Okay, um, two right answers here. Um, they aren't, I mean, they say that it's a tradition, both because they don't want to admit that they don't have the money to buy slippers and because it makes them feel better pretending that they're staying barefoot out of choice, right? Um, they're used to walking barefoot everywhere, yes, but that is a consequence of the fact that they don't have enough money to buy slippers, right? Um, and in this case, we're trying to understand why staying barefoot as a tradition, why saying that would be an excuse that people use. And so the right answers would be the first and the third. And a couple of you got that right. We have another extract. Um, a place on the periphery of Delhi, yet miles away from it. And we have a question. Two questions, I think, based on this. Sunrise has a name and it's un I just caught that. <laughs> oh, English on Wednesday. Good luck. Is your prep going well? Okay. Poetic devices. Um, it is a metaphor again and after you tell me how it's a metaphor, I will talk to you about how it's a metaphor myself. Um, but I also want to let you know really quickly that there isn't actually like a formal poetic device known as a symbolism. Symbolism is something that happens a lot in poetry. But if you if you get asked for like a poetic device, then symbolism is not like an official one. So if you choose it, it would be it would be wrong. Which particular part of that sentence is the metaphor? Is it a place on the periphery? Is it the periphery of Delhi? Is it miles away from it? Okay, um, the metaphor portion of this particular line is miles away from it. And we will talk about why in a moment. Um, sorry, my laptop is glitching a bit. So if, you know, something happens in the middle, <laughs> Very sorry in advance. Okay, tell me what it means, and then I will look at the chat because I'm sure you're saying things down there, but I'm trying to like focus on the quiz also. Okay, um, you've all chosen different things. Um, but let me talk to you about that line very briefly. 
what does it say? It's it's talking about Seema Puri, which is where the rag pickers live. And the line says, it's on the periphery of Delhi, but miles away from it. When it says it's on the periphery of Delhi, it's locating where Seema Puri is geographically, right? So it's telling us it's on the borders of Delhi. But then the second part of the line says it's miles away from Delhi. And this doesn't entirely make sense because if something's on the borders of Delhi, it's, it, it means it's quite close to Delhi in terms of location, right? What that part of the sentence is trying to tell us is that actually, even though this place is located very close to Delhi, the way that the place is makes it seem as though it is very, very far from Delhi. So Delhi is this urban place which is full of a lot of facilities and a lot of great infrastructure, right? Um, and then there is Seema Puri, which is described to us as being full of huts that are made of temporary materials and full of garbage and no sewers and basically no infrastructure, right, at all. And so the distinction that's being made when we're told that Seema Puri is miles away from Delhi is that this place is absolutely, absolutely different from Delhi. So in the sense of the way that these places are built and the nature of these places, they are entirely apart from each other. And that's why miles away becomes a metaphor because it's not actually um, distance, like literal distance, it's figurative distance. Um, and I hope that makes sense. Let me know if it doesn't. Um, and I am checking the chat now. Anu, have you asked me something? You said different Q hair and I don't know what exactly you are asking me. Um, what, what difference are you asking me about? Um, also, did you all manage to like listen to me explaining this? Um, or were you focused on talking? I can explain it again if you want me to. Okay, so you were doing both. That is fabulous multitasking and I am very pleased. Yeah, I know. I, I tried to like explain the difference between that. Um, it's far from Delhi in the sense that you know, it's actually on the outskirts of Delhi in terms of geography. Um, but in terms of what the two places are like, they're both very, very different from each other. So they're discussed as being entirely like far away from each other. So I hope that makes some sense to you. Um, and if it doesn't, we'll come back to it. Um, okay, uh, we have Another question that everyone seems to have gotten wrong. Um, Open-handed map avoiding the world its world. Okay, the poetic device here is not metaphor and not animation. Again, animation isn't actually a poetic device at all. Um, it's just a word that I picked up and threw in there. So, you know, you should know that's not a poetic device. Don't say it is at any point of time. The poetic device here is actually personification because we have a map that is awarding something to the world and maps can't award things to anything, right? Um, it's an inanimate object and yet it's being given this lifelike characteristic where it can award something. And so what's happening there is personification. This isn't actually a metaphor at all either. Um, it's awarding the world its world, so it's giving the world its world. And the two worlds here are basically just, its world refers to the drawn images on the map, so the world on the map. And the world outside the map is the first world. So what this map does is 
it's kind of showing the entire world what the world is like right uh, and that's all this sentence is saying there isn't really much of a hidden meaning in it or anything like that so no metaphor no simile and personification is what's going on with the first part of this line and then our question 22 You don't like menti, Anu? Yeah, I was also thinking about like doing one session completely on poetic devices. I thought um, maybe you wouldn't need it, but there are a lot of poetic devices to be fair, and I understand like <laughs> that it's very easy to get confused. So let me think about when to schedule something like that. Maybe when we're done with the literature portions and we're starting grammar. Okay, um, why is Shakespeare called wicked? Well, I agree that he can be difficult to understand and especially so if there are no good teachers to teach you. But in the case of this poem, it isn't actually either of those reasons, right? Um, the reason that Shakespeare is being called wicked in this specific poem is that there are all these posters of all of these beautiful things all of these things that these children can't really access in any kind of way because can they really like take a trip to say the tidal east valley in the posters can they really like buy a shakespeare's play and read it and understand it and enjoy it not really right um their circumstances and their conditions limit a lot of the things that they can do and so all of these things in the posters are sort of these things that are that are there like oh these are beautiful things and you'll never be able to reach them so it's very cruel to sort of put them on the walls it's like you're mocking the children all the time and so that's why any of these posters are called wicked or bad temptations and it's considered you know not a great thing for these posters to be there but of course what the poet is saying there is not really oh don't donate posters to such slum schools um the poet is trying to say if all you're doing is donating these posters then you're not doing much at all you're just making their lives worse in a specific instead act more thoughtfully and work towards destroying the existence of such places entirely and bring these children out of these circumstances and out of these conditions entirely we have another extract question and the extract is it is his karm his destiny and um let's talk about am i still here okay something has happened Anu says, whole sessions are better than Menti. Okay, got it. I will keep that in mind.
please let me know if I'm here so that we can keep going with the quiz. I'm just gonna try to present it. And okay, I think we are here. Okay, great. Um, sorry about that. As I said, my laptop really, really glitches sometimes. Um, but this is another extract question. It is, it is his karam, his destiny. That's the extract. And now we'll have a couple of questions based on it. And we're nearing the very end of our quiz. Um, we have like eight more questions, which is a bit longer than the duration of our class, but we can finish it. What is the destiny? What is the karam here? I don't even know if you pronounce it that way. I'm very sorry if I am destroying um, the Hindi word again. Okay, um, you've picked different things, uh, but the destiny here is that he will only be a bangle maker and we'll talk about why in a moment. Um, after you answer one more question, about this extract. I don't take special classes yet, Kulam, but I will be starting soon. Um, interesting again the right answer is actually resignation and we'll talk about why after you answer one more question we'll talk about the entire thing I haven't chosen the right answer here, so it's my fault, but the right answer is cast, and we'll talk about the entire like setup of these lines. Um, what's going on when we reach the second section of Lost Spring, Stolen Stories of Stolen Childhood, is that we move from Delhi to Uttar Pradesh, and we move to Firozabad in specific, and in Firozabad, we have Anis Jump talking to these people who have been making bangles for years and years and years and years and generations upon generations. And then she meets Mukesh's grandmother and the grandmother says, oh, it is his God-given destiny. You know, it is his karam. It is, you know, if how, what else do we do except stay within this God-given lineage? Um, and the implication of all of these lines is this can't be escaped. There's no way for us to get out. Um, this is all we can ever do. And the way that each of these lines carries on, the main emotion that we get from this is not anger. She's not saying, I wish it could be different than this. I hate that it is this way. It's not frustration because she doesn't say, I'm really angry at this. She just says, this is how it is. And that's all there is to it. It's that same kind of resignation with which some families, for instance, um, in mine, uh, people tend to say, oh, it's written on our foreheads. Um, it's, a, it's a sort of phrase that you use in Tamil to say, this is basically my life, it's already been written, and there's no way for me to escape what's been written. So I might as well just accept it. It makes me very, very sad, but that's all there is to life. And so that is the kind of sentiment that the grandmother is coming here with. And she is speaking in this particular circumstance about caste, right? Um, why is caste the God-given lineage? Because very often how we understand the caste system is we understand it as a particular dictate that's been given to us by religion and by God. And as per our understanding of this dictate, people should fit into these different professions, right? And then they just keep doing these professions forever. 
and their children will do those professions and their children will do those professions. So in this particular case, the destiny is that they are doomed to make bangles forever and the God-given lineage is caste, the caste which decides their profession, which is that of bangle making, which is their destiny. And all of the resignation that comes with this is just the, the sense that, oh, if God has given it to us, then how do we ever break out of it? And this is one of the very interesting things about this lesson. And East Chung doesn't really explicitly tell us a lot about it. But by talking about caste in this very subtle kind of manner, she manages to tell us how even if today the caste system is illegal on paper, we still have this kind of resignation that prevails in people, right? And this kind of inability to break out of the professions that have been pre-decided for them anyway, simply because of the way that infrastructure in society is set up. So she's showing us the lingering impacts of the caste system even when it isn't supposed to exist. I'm sorry, I couldn't see any of your like chat messages so far. But I am now seeing this. Okay. Yes, it's a simile and we know that because there's a comparison being made and the comparison is between the tongs of the machine and Savita's hands. And we have a like there. So it's an explicit comparison that's being made with that connecting word of like. And like and as generally like tell us that there's a simile at play. Yes, we can do it a little bit faster. Sorry about how long this is taking and sorry that I just disappeared for a good like a couple of minutes. But we're almost done. And I am very afraid that I don't know where Abhishek Sir is. Um, but presumably he'll start teaching again soon. So Okay, I've oh, Sorry, I keep doing this. I haven't chosen the right answer, but the right answer is she does it lifelessly as a machine. Um, and we know this because the key word in that comparison is her hands are moving as mechanically as a machine, right? And when we say mechanically with reference to a human being, what we mean is that they are working like a machine works and not like a person works. And the distinction we're making is generally to say they're doing things one after the other without thinking about it. They're kind of just automatically doing things. And that kind of lack of thought, that kind of lack of interest, that kind of lack of investment, all of that says that there's kind of lifelessness to the way that Savita is doing her work. She's just doing it so that she can finish it off and keep moving. Why does Mukesh not dream of flying an aeroplane? This is my favorite part of the whole lesson. Yeah, most of you got it right. Um, his dreams only stretch to what he's familiar with and that's why he dreams about cars, right? Because he's seen a lot of cars on the streets. But though airplanes do fly over um, Ferozabad and so he has seen airplanes but not very many of them. Um, the issue is really that he's not seen them enough to be able to want them and want them to be part of his life. Yeah, Himanshi and Sonia, B is the right answer for that. And what is the right answer for this? What does green leaves refer to? Oh no, <laughs> okay, um, green leaves refers to tree leaves um, in that very last verse of the poem, we're told 
open the pages of the green leaves and the white leaves and we know it's the and we know that it's nature because of the context of that particular verse also right um, we're told about how you know they should be let out into these open places um, into the sea sands especially and so when we come to green leaves it's it's a stand in for nature for tree leaves so these children should be given free access to tree leaves to nature and to books so that they have a chance to grow another poetic device question you're just naming it this time that's okay himanshi now you know that i can't say right tell you there is no poetic device called animation i was just putting that in there to kind of try and trip you all up there is a poetic device called personification but that is not in place here um instead we have a metaphor going on here and the metaphor is really just to say these children's lives are quite stuck right um a narrow street sealed in with a lead sky which is to say there aren't many avenues for them to go in to go down with regard to their futures and in fact it seems as though they are trapped within that very narrow street um by the very sky itself and so that's a metaphor for basically there aren't many places for them to go in life that's a condition of their circumstances Okay um lost spring in the title is also a metaphor and it refers to the sort of joy that you can have in childhood it doesn't necessarily refer to innocence it refers to that possibility of wonder and spring is that time of year in which plants blossom right um there's a lot of color outside everywhere you get to really experience life in that sense um it's a pretty time it's a time for things to grow and it's a good time it's generally associated with this kind of happiness and fullness right a lot of plenitude plent uh, and all of those things are what are absent from these children's lives um they don't have a lot of things they aren't very happy they don't get to grow a lot so really it encompasses a lot more than just joy but joy is the closest we can kind of come to understanding what it means that sort of joy and wonder who is sanjana well whoever sanjana is you have done um the best on this quiz so good job on that and good job to everyone else who is here too and thanks for being here and for taking part in this quiz because it was a lot of fun to have you and i had a good time talking to you all and sort of just getting to see what you're thinking along the side um thank you for being here as i said and that brings us to the end of the lesson and it's it's 4 pm so we should probably get going we're doing the second part of deep water on wednesday if you all want to join in good luck to sunrise who has an exam sunrise who is anu who has an exam and good luck to the rest of you who have exams too i know some of you have like revision tests going on and stuff so i hope they're going well um do leave a like if you like today's session leave comments if you have any feedback or any particular session that you want me to run at any point of time um and subscribe if you like this content i had a lot of fun 